ಮೀರ್ ತಪ್ಕೊಂಡು
that in the urban areas, more employees profitably, both in the organized and the non-formal sector. Sangika, Anche Mahamariyo, Mahila Sangika Masaka Mahishiralu, Srimati Marakpam Chandrasekran Garu, Nodana Yuma Hochavaniki, Mukhyati Diga Palu Nalwati, Bharata, Uparashtapati, Sri, Ah Venkat Raman Garu, Varusati Mani, Yotsono Palguna Twenty, Srimati Janaki Venkat Raman Garu, Sri, Ah Venkat Raman Garu, Varusati Mani, Yotsono Palguna Twenty, Srimati Janaki Venkat Sri R. Venkat Ramanagar, Patamar Sariga, Vijay or Chenna Twenty Sandar Palo, Manajala Tarpana Vijay or Tarpana Goranenu, Swatan Tiriya Town. Sri R. Venkat Ramanagar, Bharat Opera Katigane Gakonda, Telugu Prajani Kanika and Karakala Gatun Saina, Waral Bank of Paja Shuriga, Pramukha Ramik on Ayuriga. Madras, Rasta, Paris, Ranaki, Abdi J. Sakaja, Uparasta Pratiga, Ula twenty three, Ara Venka Ramanagaru, Mana Prakara, Ula twenty, Yupadu, Tamil Nadu, Wakanati, Alipasta, Madras, Ramanago, Manaki, Paga Purchase Sile, Karaka or Vijara, Nagarani, Puchanapuru, Waru Boysaidi, Ukoka, Pranta, and Kunundu, Adaka, Manamora, Mana, Mana Rasta Patani, Rodana, Yu Krishna Mandala, Matam Gorano, Swan Pantari.
targets to develop the industries and he has given a lot of uh, encouragement also. So, now we are presenting our Delta Vision Black and White TV to Vasa Mani of Andhari through His Excellence Sri R. Venkatraman, Vice President of India. And before that, I am introducing a brand behind our Delta Vision. Our technical director, Mr. B. V. Pichaya, to our Vice President of India, and I am requesting to hand over the TV to Srimati C. H. Vidya, President of Vasavya Mahila Mandali. As an effective instrument of social and national integration for more than half a century, Vasaya Mahila Mandali is one with it is center in this cause. Freedom to choose one's own sport without difference to caste, religion, or economic status should form one of the basic freedoms of any decent society. Our union government and the state government. Mr. I think I will give it to the girl. Sri <laughs> <laughs> Gordon. Sri Tsuna and Sri Mati Vasanta. And the Chief Mason, Sri Pullaya. My old associate and colleague, Srimadhi Maragandha Chandrasekhar, the mayor, the distinguished dedicated members of the Gora family, and Sri Vidya, and friends. This is indeed a very unique occasion in the sense that a large number of social services are clubbed together in one organization and they are all performed to the peak of perfection. When I went around the whole campus, I was deeply impressed with the variety of activities undertaken by the mandalis. We have several institutions in India which specialize in certain aspects of care of the depraved and the underprivileged. But here you have a great satisfaction. Social services is an absolute and indispensable part of the life of the country. Government cannot perform all the activities nor can it reach all the people spread over the vast country from north to south, east, west. If all the activities which are now carried on by the social service institutions had to be performed by the government, you would find that the services are poor, the services are not adequate, and oftentimes the services are even inefficient. It's here that the social service are full of a large number of the less privileged sections of society. It's no fault of ours. At a time when the world was marching ahead in industrial revolution, when people were taking advantage of the scientific revolution that was taking place, when people started going into the manufacture through machinery and equipment, India remained a dormant and sleeping country. 
not because our people had not the talent, not because our people had not the initiative and the enterprise, but solely because we were under a colonial administration. Not only Britain, but all the countries of the world, which had colonial empires, saw to it that the colonies were good markets for their products and did not allow any development, whether it is scientific, industrial or otherwise, to grow within their colonies. And that is why we launched our various five-year plans. We wanted to telescope the progress that has been made by other countries over centuries into decades. And that is where our initiative started. But having a very large population, it was not possible to bring home to all of them the fruits and benefits of the industrial development. And asking for food aid, asking for help, asking for gift. And what is the position today? We produce 150 million tons of food, and not only that, we are self-sufficient in food, we are even able to export food during the last year and this year. We have given food aid to poverty line. And this has to be tackled. And it is here that the services of the social welfare institutions come up. But for the large number of social welfare institutions, started by dedicated people like Mr. Gora and his family. I have known several of them in South India, in the Tamil Nadu, in Kerala, in Karnataka and so on. Our conditions would have been much more miserable than what it is today. You must also take note of the change that is coming over our society. Hitherto, it was enough if one member of the family earned to maintain his family. Today, with the rising cost of living in every aspect, with the rising standard of living to the people, it is no longer possible for a single individual to earn and maintain the family. Additional income has to come by way of either part-time work or full-time work in the family in order to keep up both the standard of life as well as meet the increasing cost of living. Therefore, women have taken to work out of compulsion and they have got to work whether it is in their own native home or elsewhere. And if they are obliged to work elsewhere, all the social problems emanate out of it. They have to find a house. There is no joke. If any of you are engaged in doing public work, you would know how difficult it is to come by money for public work. It's easy to come by money for other purposes, but if you want for public work, for public service, it's very difficult to do. It's therefore my appeal to all of you that if you are generously disposed and you want to do charity, it is one of the ingrained habits of the Indian people. But channel it here after through institutions rather than give it by way of individual direct. If you channel it through institutions, it will reach the persons who are in need of it. It would be systematic, it would be organized, and it would be efficient. Gone are the days when we used it to fight as the limb leaders of the West. But she was one of those who wanted to build up the stature of women in India to give them a dignity, to give them an independence within the broad parameters of the Indian culture and Indian civilization. Therefore, this name will always remain. Nothing can be done in this world. Nothing can be achieved in this world without dedication. You have maybe have the money, you may have the enthusiasm, but unless you are dedicated to your cause, you will never be able to achieve results. And this dedication has come traditionally in this house. And I find that it is also being passed on to the succeeding generations of the children of Mr. Gora and Vaidya. I have great pleasure in inaugurating this working women's hostel named after our respected and dear leader, Indira Gandhi, and wish you all success.
in your universe. Thank you very much. On behalf of Vatra Mahila Mangali, it is my pleasant duty to propose the Nagar Sabha to his people who are gathered here. We are grateful to the Vice President and the Minister of Social Welfare for their kind advice and guidance. We are sure with the kind cooperation of all, the Vatra Mahila Mangali will march ahead to render assistance to the poor and the needy with many programs in a humble way. without swords. But there comes a point where prudence overcomes their revival. One of the killer whales and a couple of master bulls are face to face in the surf. Then the killers turn away, and the colony seems safe. But some of the colony's young bachelors are still in water. Killer whales have been seen actually on the beach, having run ashore to catch a sea lion. 
but this time it looks as though their prey has given itself up. of whales and white water, a young bull sea lion has met his end. These secluded shores are a favorite place for all kinds of seagoing mammals. There's a colony of elephant seals breeding further up the coast on the steep pebble beaches of Punta Norte. And just offshore, a southern white whale lazes in the water. Like the whales, elephant seals have been commercially valuable as a source of oil. Consequently, they were overhunted and practically wiped out. It's only in nearly remote places like this that they were able to find any peace. And Punta Norte is now an official sanctuary protected by Argentine law. They're recovering their number at last, now that their carcasses are no longer sought after to make oil for clocks and lamps. As the elephant seals doze, the right whale kicks up a flurry of water. Something's upset it, and a flash of a dorsal fin shows it's killer whales. The right whale is thrashing the water to drive them away. Killer whales must seldom kill and eat a right whale. They're only one tenth of its size. Sea lions are much easier meat. The killers usually swallow them whole. The sea lions are fat at this time of year, their bodily reserves built up for the breeding season. While the females are preparing to give birth to this season's pups, the bulls fight for the right to sire next season's offspring. It's an arduous life for a master bull, continually defending his harem against ambitious intrudes. It's no less arduous for females, giving birth amongst the hurly burly of the sea lion colony. Sea lions are marine mammals too, but they're not so completely marine as whales and dolphins. They have to come ashore to give birth. Judging from the contortions of this female, it can be a painful business. It's a breech birth, the baby emerging tail first into this noisy, pebbly world. As soon as the birth is complete, the infant sea lion becomes the object of a dispute. A neighboring mother thinks it's hers. The baby gets forgotten for a moment during the quarrel. But it's soon settled, and mother and child can get to know each other. The cries of the babies on the beach are now competing with the roars of the bulls as the population grows hourly. There's still a good deal of quarreling going on, but the business of the breeding season is nearly over. Soon the sea lions will return to their adopted home in the sea. But for as long as they're on the beach, the killer whales are waiting for the careless or the foolhardy. Ominous black and white shapes cruise the shallows, having abandoned their bit of mischief with the right whale. The surf pounding the beach reduces visibility, otherwise the extraordinary charge you're about to see might have accounted for yet another sea lion.
the killer whale was chasing shadows. But attacks like this must succeed sometimes, or the killers wouldn't be prepared to take the risk of getting stranded. Scientists would like to know more about the life of marine mammals. Sea lions and seals are relatively easy to study on the shore. But to find out about the wanderings of wild dolphins in the open ocean has been impossible up to now. Bert and Mel Worsi are zoologists and electronics experts who would like to track dolphins by radio. But first, they've got to catch one. Bernd Wersig's dolphin catcher is simple in principle. It's a spring-loaded grab with a trigger between the rubber-covered prongs. All he has to do is to place it firmly on a dolphin's tail while his wife, Mel, drives the boat. It's easy to get close to a school of dolphins in a boat. They love to swim alongside, playing in the bow wave. But although they're easy to approach, Catching them is another matter. Strike one is unsuccessful. But the sea is alive with dolphins offering a second chance. The head of the grab is designed to come off if a dolphin is caught. Now it can be hauled in on a strong line. The grab doesn't harm the dolphin in the least. It fits round its tail snugly enough to lift 200 pounds into the boat. The other members of the school are apparently quite undisturbed by the disappearance of one of their number. Mel waters the dolphin to keep it cool, while Bernd measures its vital statistics. What do you have to do? It's a fully grown adult, a member of a school that's been in the Golfo San Jose for some weeks. To keep track of the school, Bernd attaches a radio transmitter to the dolphin with a boat through the fleshy part of its dorsal fin. The operation's painless. It's about the equivalent of a girl having her ears pierced. In Bernd's previous work, he has been identifying dolphins from action photographs, using the individual patterns and shapes of the dorsal fin. This one must join the gallery although it now has its own call sign as well. The radio will work for 10 days before the battery runs out. Then the boat will corrode away and the radio will drop off. During its useful life, there is a mass of valuable information to be collected and stored. The capture has been watched from the shore by Peter Tayak, the Wersig's assistant. He notes the position of the boat as the walkie-talkie announces that the radio dolphin has been launched. Okay, thanks a lot. Standing by. Now it's time to start recording the dolphin's movements. The radio sends out a beep every time the dolphin surfaces, and a direction finder automatically notes its bearing. All the information is recorded on tape for analysis later. Bernd and Mel can return to base to watch the dolphins electronically. But on the way, they augment their portrait gallery, photographing other dolphins leaping round the boat in the hope of identifying some old friends from the pictures. There's no shortage of entertainment on the way home, but still the true significance of those wild leaps isn't clear. Back at base, 
they sort through some of the earlier photographs to see if they can recognize any of the dolphins they've been visiting today. After long experience, they can identify some individuals by their peculiarities of fin shape or color. There it is again. No, it isn't. Since the dolphins have to be wholly or partly in the air to be identified, Mel has acquired a series of dramatic leaps and somersaults rivaling anything taken by tourists at the Dolphinarium. The action pictures are fun as well as science, but the recording and analysis of the radio signals is hard, painstaking work. For the first 24 hours, they're monitored continuously. Then readings are taken half an hour every four hours. That's enough to see the trend of the dolphin's movements. A school of dolphins sticks close together, so the movements of one member faithfully reflect the movements of them all. The direction finder at base is linked by radio to another some distance away, and the readings from the two together enable Burnt to plot exactly where the radio dolphin and its school are. The dolphins may be up to eight miles away across the bay, but Burnt can locate them exactly. The direction finder in front of him gives one bearing on the radio signal, and the other, five miles off on the cliffs, gives a different signal. Where the two bearing lines cross is where the dolphins are. X marks the spot, in fact. A series of plots like this trace the dolphins' course as they go about their daily affairs. The facts and figures accumulate fast. The unfettered freedom of a wild dolphin's life must be reduced to orderly columns of figures for a man to understand. Gradually, a pattern is emerging, but it's still too soon to predict just what they'll be doing at any given time. But the radio dolphin, like a spy in the camp, can tell him where the school is. Using a portable set in the boat, and guided by Peter with a walkie-talkie on the shore, Burnt can visit the school to see for himself. The dolphins move around the bay, but probably not at random. With the direction finder, they're easy to follow. By keeping the bleeps in line ahead of the boat, Burnt and Mel have been able to follow one particular group all day to watch their activities. They find that smaller groups within the school stick together. Perhaps they are family parties. The land-based direction finder keeps up a steady flow of cross bearings. Combined with the boat's own receiver, it keeps Burnt and Mel on target. They might cover 80 miles in a day following the dolphins. There can't be many scientific projects so delightful to pursue. Although the dolphins range all round the bay, there are some parts which they prefer above others, including a particular strip down the center. Burnt's next task will be to find out why this is. But that will have to wait until he knows much more about the school's daily movements. His other interest is in their acrobatics. With their streamlined shape, dolphins are perfectly capable of re-entering the water with hardly a ripple, as they do at the dolphin area. The splashing isn't accidental, it's deliberate. It must have a purpose, but what that purpose is, is a mystery. A side landing like this needs a twist of the body to produce the biggest splash, as the slow motion film shows. 
High jumps can be built up by a trainer with fish as a prize. But they're unnatural, just a stunt. It's the low jumps that are most interesting. Why do dolphins do it? Tricks like jumping over a rope are a piece of cake. They require much less skill than a really good double splash with tail snap. dolphins communicating with each other, or getting rid of parasites, or need it be so serious in intent? The study has only just begun. But Berndt is sometimes tempted to think that his beautiful, powerful acrobats are simply jumping for joy in the freedom of the oceans.